Our first reading comes from Genesis chapter 2, beginning to read from verse 15 to 25. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field, all the birds of the air. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the, ma the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all livestock, the birds of the air, and all the beasts of the field. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall in a deep sleep. And when he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united with his wife, and they will become one flesh. The man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. The gospel of our salvation as recorded in the gospel of St. John, chapter 15, verse 26. Then we jump to chapter 16, verse 4 to verse 15. The gospel of our salvation as recorded in the gospel of St. John, chapter 15, verse 26. Then we jump to 16, 4 to 15. When the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. Chapter 16, verse 4. I have told you these so that when their time comes, you will remember that I warned you about them. I did not tell you these from the beginning because I was with you. But now I'm going to him who sent me. None of you asked me, where are you going? Rather, you are filled with grief because I have said these things. But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because people do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I'm going to the Father where you can see me no longer. And about judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. And he will tell you about what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. And this is the gospel of our salvation. Amen. Uh, good morning. How are you this morning? Happy Pentecost. Uh, thank you very much, Reverend, and the leadership of the church. I'm glad to be here today. Uh, my wife, Sophia, 
who is actually an attached, uh, one of the attached clergies uh, in the Anglican Church, sent me with greetings. So I'm representing her, even though we're going to talk a little bit about the ladies as well. Uh, I work uh, with Nairobi Chapel. I'm a pastor there, uh, but also serve with a ministry called Transform Nations. And some of you men, I have been here before. The last time I was here, this building was not complete. Uh, so just to see this good work, uh, praise be to the Lord. And I know he's not only working in the building, he's working in your hearts. For the ladies who are here, would you give me permission to wish you happy belated Mother's Day? Um, I celebrate you. I celebrate my mom who is 88 years today. And uh, she has taught me a lot. Uh, she's been an Anglican since when I was, we were very young, a mother's uh, union leader. Uh, she has just modeled Christ. In fact, uh, last year during Mother's Day, I decided to honor her. So I invited her to Nairobi where I was preaching that day. And I launched a book that I wrote, which is about the 10 lessons I learned from my mother. And the first one is, uh, God comes first, and 10 others. And this morning I brought a few of those copies, um, I think 10 only, uh, of the power of a mother, 10 lessons I learned from my mother. In case you want to get a copy at the end, you could. But happy belated Mother's Day. For all the fathers, uh, happy Father's Day in advance. <laughs> it's going to be next month. But all the men who have done man enough, one, two, three. Ahu, yeah? One, two, three. Ahu. Ladies, one, two, three. <laughs> and I'm really excited to be here today. And I want to very quickly uh, share with us in summary, biblical womanhood and manhood. What does the Bible look at or tell us or invite us to when we talk about uh, manhood and womanhood, or masculinity and femininity. And uh, today being Pentecost Sunday, I believe the Holy Spirit comes into our lives. As Jesus uh, said, I'll go and ask the Father to send the Holy Spirit so that he may help you, he may lead us into all truth. And part of that is being the man God wants us to be. And the women, God wants us to be. But let me make a few observations, even before we get into defining it. Society has undergone great changes, uh, uh, especially in this area of gender, masculinity, and femininity. A lot has changed. When I was young, men were mainly the providers. They went out and brought food home. Today, we have some ladies who are earning way more than men. In fact, some studies showed recently, uh, I think the worship leader is not married yet, are you? Uh, yeah, you look like you're praying uh, for someone. So uh, just to use you as an example, you are most likely to marry a lady who earns more than you. If the statistics in Kenya are right, that between 25 and 35, generally the ladies are earning more than men. Uh, so is that going to be a problem for you? He is not sure. Now, if you, are, if you are strategic, that's not a problem. It's money coming to the house. But a lot of men are afraid of that because they feel, uh, is she going to be able to be submissive? Are we going to live well? Those are questions. Uh, a long time ago, the man was the protector because God has given us more mass or mass. Uh, uh, even though with the gym these days, the ladies are also very masculine, ma muscular. Uh, but generally, God has given us more muscles. So what if, uh, worship leader, what if you married a lady who is a cop, who is a provider, who is a protector? Yeah? When bad people approach you, you're going to tell her, honey, please deal with them. I'm praying for you because, <laughs> because you're a cop. So a lot has changed. And we need to redefine what does biblical masculinity look like and what does biblical femininity look like. Men never used to go to the kitchen these days. 
worship leader, you're likely going to be told, is it your duty today to be getting uh, into the kitchen to help uh, as I do a course online? That's likely what your wife is going to be telling you. Challenges uh, that come in life get to the core of our identity, who we really are. And gender or sex, I prefer to use sex because uh, those who are destroying the place of gender like to use gender and say gender is a social construct of who we are as men and women. But from the Bible, sex was assigned at birth. If you're a man at birth, you're a man in life. Today they are telling us differently. That's why they like to use gender. Uh, so allow me to use more uh, sex than gender. Uh, so I am saying gen uh, sex is at the core of who we are. Uh, and there are lots of uh, things that are attacking the gender or sexuality. Here we're looking at radical feminism. Feminism started out well in the beginning. It was to correct some injustices that were happening, but eventually it became very radical and was taken by a few people who began to dismiss masculinity. One of the mothers of femininity once said, uh, women don't need men because fish don't need a bicycle. That's what she said. She's called Gloria Steinem. And she said, we don't need you as men. That was radical feminism that attacks masculinity and doesn't want anything to do uh, with masculinity. Then we have toxic masculinity. Uh, men who use violence against the women, men who dominate and harass uh, the women because they feel that they are in power. Then there's neutrality where you say, you could choose whether you're a man or a woman. I've seen some bathrooms in the, in the West which are neutral. You could go there, uh, whichever way you like. You could go there. Uh, they're neither male nor female. Um, and then, of course, we have the LGBTQ. The LGBTQ. So I think something has gone wrong. But I'll continue because you can hear me. LGBTQ+. Plus. Now they have queer plus, several other things. It's interesting when you go to some nations these days, it's not only asking whether you're male or female. There are actually several options that you can take, uh, not just male or female. There are many options. In one country, there are about 42 different options. <laughs> of your sex or your gender. Uh, and unfortunately, this thing is beginning to come to our homes. Two weeks ago, I was talking to a 10-year-old boy who goes to Sunday school. He was telling me, you know, I'm not too sure whether I'm a boy. I feel like a girl. Uh, I feel like I'm a girl trapped in a boy's body. <laughs> This is a 10-year-old boy telling me that. Uh, a lot of people saying, I can identify with that or that. And that, unfortunately, is coming to uh, our country. Recently, a lady in one of her schools in this region was caught. Uh, the headmistress was being paid a lot of money to recruit girls in that school to become lesbians. And she was on salary, the principal, every month, getting more than 50000 so that she may recruit with a guiding and counseling teacher. Uh, so uh, that militant destruction of sex or gender uh, has been there, gender-based violence and things like that. But the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27 and 28. Let me read it for us. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Uh, fill the earth and subdue it. Roll over the fish of the sea and the birds in, uh, in the sky. And over every living creature that moves on the ground. Several things we note from this scripture, and I love it because it's a foundation, that number one, God created sex. It's God who created masculinity and femininity. It's not a construction of society, as some people like to make us believe. They call it social construct. It's what you believe in your mind and agree in the society. It's not. 
I'd like to say usually gender or sex is a spiritual construct. When you attack masculinity and femininity, you attack God in his image. Because the Bible says in his image he created male and female. Men were created to show the likeness of God in their masculinity. Women to show the likeness of God in their femininity. So gender is a blessing. And in it, we get to fulfill God's blessing. But number two, both of them were blessed, male and female. They were blessed, given power by God. We have been given the Holy Spirit as men and women to be fruitful, to multiply, to fill the earth, to impact the earth. So no one is lesser than the other. We just play different rules, uh, roles. The woman is blessed of God. The man is blessed of God. So we play these roles of, bless, uh, of fulfilling God's call for us. But the devil is trying to destroy this understanding of the beauty of femininity and masculinity. So I wonder, as looking at the design God has given us, from the physiology to the hormones God gives us, uh, to the roles that we play out of the Bible and in real life, what is biblical femininity? And what is biblical masculinity? Are you still with me? Is this how you look when you're really listening? All right. Um, so uh, uh, we like to say mwanaume ni. Mwanaume ni? Effort, eh? Mwanaume ni jasho. They are saying, mwanaume ni? Wallet. I was talking to some Christian ladies the other day. I asked them, mwanaume ni? And all of them said, Wallet. I said, I thought you were Christians. Uh, why are you after the money first? And you know what one of them told me? You know, we believe in faith, but we cannot eat faith. <laughs> uh, we need some money. So, worship leader, you're in trouble as, uh, as you pray for uh, your wife. But, you know, I said, I how many kiatu? I how many gari? I how many sauti? I how many I was saying, one am Kenny, and Guinea on a seman is Sura, and Guinea on a seman it a beer, Kwanza Ile Mandiqua Coleso, eh, one am Kenny Tabia, eh, one am Kenny Pesat Pier, eh, one am Kenny Vituvinki. But what does the Bible show us? So as we have prayed and waited on God with my wife for the last 10, 15 years, we came up with this definition, which is a guide. I'll give it to you very quickly uh, right now. Number one for the men, and those of you who did man enough have an idea, uh, we use the hand to define, and we say, a real man takes initiative. So the thump of masculinity is taking initiative. If you look at the way the man was created and the way uh, the roles men play from getting married almost in every culture of the world, even in India and Asia where the ladies pay the dowry, it's really the man who asked the woman whether she would marry him. Uh, and it's just the way it is created. Uh, rarely do you hear the lady being the one to us. Once in a while that happens in our culture uh, uh, around the world and in many other cultures. But generally, men take initiative. In fact, when you look at Genesis uh, chapter 3, you will see the first failure of Adam was to not talk and not act when he was supposed to do that. So the enemy came to the lady and said, you know, this fruit is very nice. It is going to make you wise better. And it's going to make you like God. Eat it. And then the lady took it and it, ate it. And then gave to the husband who was together with her. Genesis 3, 6. The man was not on a trip, business trip. He was actually right there when this happened. He saw the enemy lie to his woman. He said nothing. He did nothing. Masculinity is about taking initiative, whether it's in decisions or whether it's in uh, actions or relationships. 
I was talking to some women uh, about relationships, uh, about, you know, uh, marriage. And I remember asking them, can you write for me somewhere your number one frustration about the men in your lives? And guess what? Almost everything they wrote was about taking initiative. This man, I tell him, I ask him to do something and he just doesn't say anything. And one week later, it's not done. I ask him to fix the sink and he doesn't fix it. And three years later, it's still not fixed. Or three months later, or three weeks later. The greatest frustration of ladies about men is, would you take initiative? Would you rise up and do what you're supposed to do? Do? Would you lead us in devotions? Would you lead us as a family? That's what they're looking at. And Adam failed in that. He said nothing, did nothing when he should have acted when the enemy was lying to his wife. But a lot of us men struggle in this area with uh, shame. So we don't want to take action because of shame of what we have done. Procrastination, I'll do it next month. One time my wife told me, you know, I think we need to do something about, uh, you know, the pump. We have a pump uh, for the house, for water. And I said, I'm going to do it. Two weeks later, I had not done it. And I came home and found Omondi fixing the pump. And then I was told, here is a bill, pay Omondi. <laughs> and I said, but I was about to call someone to come and fix. Said it took too long, I had to do it. <laughs> I didn't feel very nice as a man because I feel like I should have done that. But she has beaten me to it. Some of you ladies are smiling like something in your house needs to be fixed. Huh? Um, sometimes it's fear of criticism or just failure or because of what we have gone through. I struggle with initiative myself. And there's one area I pray that the Holy Spirit will help me to take initiative. What about ladies, which is a place, the rule of the thumb, where they struggle most with? It's standing securely. We're saying an authentic woman stands securely with self-esteem, confidence, beauty, knowing she is unique. You see, where the enemy lied to the woman was, you can be more than you are if you eat this fruit. I've talked to ladies in many places. And I'm surprised, even those that society think they're very pretty, they still struggle with some areas of insecurity. I remember talking to a lady who actually acts in Hollywood, in the movies, and she's really uh, pretty in worldly standards. And she told me, because we were doing a focus group, to say, what are your struggles as a lady? And she said, my one uh, struggle when I leave the movie theater, uh, the, the movie screen, and I go out, I don't feel feel like I have what it takes as a lady. And I said, but everybody celebrates you. You're this. I said, no, I, sometimes I just feel like my nose should have been a little longer and here it should have been. The challenge that a lot of ladies face is, uh, you know, in the place of standing securely in who you are and knowing God did not make a mistake when he created you. Many years in Africa would have said, God was not hoping for a boy when he created your girl. Now, it may not uh, matter much because we have accepted girls as well. But many years ago, we never used to, uh, we would prefer getting baby boys. So, ladies, an authentic lady does what? Stand securely. Say with me, an authentic lady? Look like you're standing securely. An authentic lady? Good. Give a smile and look like you enjoy yourself in your skin. You're okay. Your body, your uh, you know, uh, skin complexion, you don't have to be any different. For men, the second thing is living responsibly. And for ladies, it's walking in purity. It's really about character for both of us. That we need to be manaume manamke ni character. If, uh, you know, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 2, uh, verse uh, 16 and 17 that we read earlier, God said, you can eat everything you want here except for this one thing. What he was telling him is you can enjoy your femininity and masculinity eventually in this garden. But if you want to live well and prosper, you must follow the word of God. A 
great man is the one who follows God's word in terms of financial integrity. He can be trusted with money. He can be trusted with sexuality. He's faithful to his wife and he does what is right morally. And then uh, he can be trusted with other relationships, with business. He's not stealing from the government or doing corruption. That's true masculinity, integrity, living responsibly. And for the ladies, is walking in purity, not allowing the enemy to mess up with your clean spirit to make you uh, do things that you shouldn't do. So walking in purity. But sometimes because of our pride as men, uh, because of the challenges we face, because of the opportunities and wanting to be ahead, we compromise our integrity. Sometimes as ladies, because of our wounds and things we have gone through before and wanting to get that relationship, you compromise on your purity. The next one. So we're saying a real man takes initiative and lives responsibly. An authentic lady stands securely and walks in purity. The next one here is that a real man leads sacrificially. God has created us as men to do headship in the family. To, to, for me to lead my wife as a husband and lead the family as a father as I play those roles. How am I going to lead? Am I going to lead uh, with dominance, uh, with power? You know, uh, there's those men in early days when they walked home, everybody scattered because uh, they were feared. Leading through fear is not the best because when people stop fearing you, they don't follow you anymore. But when you lead by love, headship through service, through sacrifice as Jesus taught us, then you become the man that God celebrates, a man of vision, a man of service, a man who is selfless. You lead well. And God is looking for those kind of husbands, worship leader, who's going to lead with love when the time comes. I hope in two years uh, you will be there to lead sacrificially. He's very happy. I think he has been praying in that direction. Uh, so leading well. But for the ladies, it's about being a helper. By the way, did you know that the word helper that is used in Genesis 3.20 for the lady is the same word, Ezra, that is used for God, our help. So when God calls you a helper as a lady, he's not inferior. God is our help, our Ezra. And Ezra means strong enough to stand by yourself and strong enough to support others. So as you support your husband, it's not because you're not strong. The Bible calls you a helper. The name also given, God is our help. God is our helper. The same word, so it's not less. So you influence graciously as a lady. You influence wherever you are with your personality, with your words, with your relationships, with the sixth sense. Ladies seem to have that. As I come uh, to the last two, uh, one time I was sitting uh, in, uh, in, in a plane, I was traveling somewhere, and the lady who was sitting next to me was this very pretty, uh, good lady. And we talked a little bit uh, in the process. I told her what I do, and she told me what she does. Uh, and, and she seemed like a real good woman until... Uh, you know, uh, the air, uh, you know, um, assistant came uh, and came and asked some questions. And then she got, I don't know what work, worked her up. She was being asked, are you taking orange juice or these are juice? And she got worked up and said words from my mouth that I couldn't imagine. Uh, my eyes were open. I was wondering, what is this? And she started abusing the lady and calling her and saying, didn't you go to school? And then I looked and, you know, all the beauty just disappeared that I had seen because of what came out of her mouth. The ability to influence graciously brings out the best of femininity, not roughly, not manipulatively, but God has called you to be able to lead in a very gracious way as a man lead, uh, to influence in gracious way as a man lead like Christ taught us. 
Then, last, uh, you know, fourthly, both of us are called to love. These are the fingers now of love. So a woman is to, a uh, man is take initiative, live responsibly, lead sacrificially. A woman is to uh, stand securely. Ladies, you're not helping me. Uh, walk in purity and... <laughs> Walk in purity and influence graciously. Now the one of love, this is what it says. We are both to love with our hearts. When we look at where we read, the Bible says a man was knocked down, a lady was made out of uh, the side, uh, and someone said not from the head, uh, not from the back, but from the side, so that they walk uh, side by side. And when the man woke up, a kanza mistari. This is now born of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. See, every man, when they fall in love, they get poetic. They start saying nice words. That's what you see in the Bible. Uh, you know, write some good words, as you will, sir. Uh, when the time comes. Uh, but love has a way of expressing itself. So as men, God has called us to love faithfully. To love faithfully. This is a challenge I found as a man. Many times the greatest temptation of man is to multiply the chances of love. Whether it's mpango akando or loving someone else they shouldn't be loving. That's a big challenge of us men. Looking and desiring something, uh, you know, another person that is not yours. It's a great uh, challenge. So God has called us to love faithfully. And we, we struggle in some ways. Whether it's from for pornography or as I said, mpango uh, akando. Then for the ladies, the, sometimes they struggle with that. But the major struggle of ladies as we have talked with them is the ability to love deeply. Deeply. Because when a woman gets hurt, they withdraw their love. They are with you there. They love you enough to cook for you and help you. But the love only goes this deep. Because you have hurt them. Ladies have a way of protecting their heart and building walls so that you can only come this far because I don't want to be hurt. And sometimes you find them in a relationship, in a marriage, and they are not loving with the depth of their heart. So God calls you to love uh, as, as uh, you know, we learn from God's word with the help of the Holy Spirit. Of course, love wisely, but love deeply with the depth of your heart. Don't love out of woundedness and hold back love. So both of us are supposed to show love to one another in marriage and to other people outside. And then lastly, both of us are supposed to build a legacy, a worthwhile legacy. We build a legacy. Every one of us, one day we're going to fall to the ground and people are going to come to bury us and I've been in several funerals in the last two weeks, maybe three funerals. And hear this, whenever I've gone to a funeral, I've never heard anybody say, this person sleeping here, woman or man, was great because of the house he lived in. Or this is a car you, she used to drive. Or this is a money they left in the bank. Nobody talks about that. Especially if you're doing a funeral in the village. They tell you don't talk for long. Because So we summarize your uh, story only with a few minutes. So they only say what is important. Do you know what they talk about? Three things which are important. Which is your significance at the end of life. Number one. They say this person sleeping here had a good character. She loved God, and she was honest, and he was a good man. He could be trusted. They talk about character and faith. Number two, they talk about relationships. She was a good mother. He was a good husband. She was a good boss. He was a good neighbor. They talk about relationships. Lastly, they talk about impact. He was a chair of a school near here, and he made an impact there, or she was this and the other. That's what they talk about. So, they talk about those three things. That is, relationships, character and faith, and impact. That's what matters at the end of life. So, as a lady, are you working towards that? 
Beyond success, there's significance. As a man, are you working towards that? Adam left a bad name. Through Adam, all of us failed. But through Jesus and via the Holy Spirit, now we can overcome where Adam failed. I pray that all of you as men and women, we will work with the Holy Spirit to build a good legacy of our name. And so I summarize with this, and sorry I had to go very first, that uh, a real man takes initiative lives responsibly. Uh, ladies, that's the kind of man you're looking for to marry. Lives responsibly, character, leads sacrificially, loves faithfully, and builds and leaves a worthwhile legacy. And for the lady, uh, an authentic lady, stands securely in who she is in Christ, not what she has in this world. And number two, influences graciously uh, no, uh, walks in purity, influences graciously, loves deeply and wisely, and leaves a worthwhile legacy. What if all of us would rely on the Holy Spirit to teach us that? You know, the summary of all of that I have said is following Jesus. Jesus showed all of those things. Jesus took initiative and came to die for us. Jesus, uh, you know, uh, uh, was a man of character walked in purity, never, the Bible says tempted in every way but without sin, walked in purity, and lived responsibly. That's Jesus. Uh, Jesus was a leader and influenced and led other people with integrity, with sacrifice, selflessly. In other words, Jesus is the summary of masculinity and femininity. Women, as they live like Jesus, uh, they show the image of God. Men, as they live like Jesus, they show the image of God. So which of those areas are you struggling with? Where do you need to work better as a lady? Is it in uh, which of the five? Do you say, God help me by the Holy Spirit of Pentecost to live better here? Let me uh, conclude by talking about man enough and Ezra. Uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the vicar would, would laugh for us, especially the ladies to do this program, Ezra, which we, uh, uh, we have done. It's like the woman enough. And it's really about, uh, it's about, uh, this is a book that we use. It's about learning that. What I've talked to you about is lesson one of the book Ezra. But there are many other topics there uh, that uh, can be learned. Roles of a woman, lady on a mission, the wounded soul, sex and sensibility, traps on the way, the lady called, embracing significance. So it's a journey of femininity to deal with yourself so that you can become the lady God wants you to be. And for the men, it's man enough that we have done here before. And probably we're going to be able to do that from next month uh, so that we grow into it. Uh, we talk about manhood defined. We talk about roles of a man. We talk about um, uh, 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 purpose as men. We talk about the wounded warrior. Uh, we talk about man and sex. We talk about finishing well. We talk about the man code, living well according to the code of the Bible. And lastly, we talk about for God and country. So we are looking forward to working together with you to promote masculinity and femininity as God would have it. May the Lord help us by the Holy Spirit to show the watching world the beauty and God's intention of masculinity and femininity. Let me pray. Almighty God, as we have gone through this, we realize that we have our personal struggles in different areas. Some of us as Ladies, we might be struggling with security in who we are. We feel like we're not beautiful enough or enough as a mother or as a wife. And we just want to pray that you will help us deal with that. So that we may be those who represent you well. We may know that we are secure in Christ Jesus. Lord, as men, we may have some other areas where we struggle. Maybe in our being faithful. Maybe in our taking initiative, we struggle to rise up to the responsibilities that you've given us. 
And really, we cannot be real men without uh, being able to follow Jesus in all these areas. And for the ladies, we cannot be real ladies, authentic ladies, unless we follow Jesus. And it begins with the place where we surrender our lives to you. So let me just ask as I conclude that prayer as our heads are bowed. Would you be here as a woman, as a lady, and you want to say, I want to allow God to have my life so that through the Holy Spirit, he can lead me to be that kind of a woman and that kind of a man because I'm not born again. I don't know Jesus, and I need him to come into my life and by the Holy Spirit to help me become that. Is there anyone you could raise your hand? I pray with you. If there's anyone, raise your hand and then put it down, and I'll pray with you once I see it. Is there any person like that would like on this Pentecost day to make a decision to follow Jesus? Anyone? Please raise your hand. Let me see it. And I'll pray for you wherever you are. Okay. Uh, thank you. I saw one hand. And I want to ask if you're a lady and you realize you struggle with this thing of security, a wound there, or as a man you struggle with an area, just raise your hand with me as we surrender to the Lord. So Lord, we just surrender to you in our areas of struggle today. On this Pentecost day, we ask for your forgiveness and we ask you to work in us, to build us, to be the men and the women that you want us to be. And where we have hurt others in our masculinity, we ask you to forgive us. Where we have hurt others in our femininity, we ask you to forgive us. Make us what you want us to be. We bless you, Heavenly Father. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Amen.